I work for Red Hat and the the end goal here is getting HDR support in Wayland. But it turns out that getting HDR also means we have to get color management right. So that has been something I've been working on for quite some time now. Um, there are quite a number of things I want to talk about, but basically first an overview about what the, basically where the state of what you usually are like using on a, um, on your normal systems, what's going on there. Uh, I, I guess most, most of you are using either non-color managed or color managed things on X11, um, because that is basically where things are today. Uh, then I also want to say like what our plan is really what, what we want to do and the, the active color management model that we have in mind for Wayland and how that is an improvement over what we have right now in X11. Um, my goal here is basically to, to make sure that uh, we can all get our favorite applications over to a new color managed world where we have HDR and everything is working perfectly well. Um, so for that, I'm also giving a kind of a small crash course on Wayland and how it works. And then uh, a few more details about HDR and why that is kind of hard to do. And then in the end, a bit about what you as a user have to expect or what we want to expose to users and how you can benefit from that. Uh, and, and the first part here is, is, is there is a repository in free de uh, on gitlab.freedesktop.org and we spent quite a while on trying to figure out what we want to do and trying to figure out what color management is and what, what part of it should be where and how we should handle everything. And so we kind of documented everything. We, we collected links and uh, we wrote guides and everything. So if, if you are at all interested in colorimetry and color and anything like that, this is a good place to start. Um, so yeah, if, if there's anything that you don't know, don't understand, or you, if you're writing an application and you want to make sure that the colors are all doing the right thing, uh, then this is a good place to go. Right, so as I said, for most for most of us, we are either not doing like caring about color management at all, or we are stuck on X11. And X11 means that um, we have color management, but it's all inside the applications themselves. Like there's nothing that X11 does with colors. It, it's it's done basically. It just gets some data and puts it on the screen. It doesn't, it doesn't have any concept of what colors even are or what to do with them. There's a lot of configuration that is around. And sometimes it's a bit confusing about what is actually in use. There's the uh, X11 atoms that, that point to an ICC file that is apparently in use for a specific display. Then there's ColorD, which might have an entry for a specific display. And then, of course, clients implement color management on their own because that's how it's done on X11. And they might look at the uh, X11 atom, they might look at color D. Um, they are probably having some own configuration. Like, I think all of the, the applications right now have a kind of UI to choose the ICC profile. And uh, you can ignore just whatever is in the uh, set on the display. Uh, on, on the lower levels, like with X11, you get different backends. Nowadays, it's mostly KMS, but still KMS is a bit weird. Like it, the way you, the, the compositor is talking with the hardware, basically. And it's, it's a bit, you would hope that whatever the compositor is doing is what actually the display re receives. But in reality, there's a lot of state that can be in one way or the other that affects whatever is going out on the cable. 
So all of this can influence how color is really managed. And in the end, also, like, displays have a lot of knobs nowadays. They have not just the things that are physically present, like most of us probably play with the on-screen display and change some settings or whatever. But nowadays, there's also programmatic access to some of the display features. You can, um, they sometimes implement modes, like, for example, HDR is implemented as some kind of uh, special mode that you can in enter into. And if that mode is entered into, then it accept it wants a completely different signal on the cable. And uh, so far, uh, X11 didn't handle any of that. This is, this is a bit confusing, but this is basically what's going on right now. Uh, you have weird. So in the middle is basically X11, but uh, there can be any kind of clients changing anything, basically. like. Uh, if, if you're running a window manager, like if you're running GNOME or KDE, then there's a separate process that might apply the VCGT tag, which is like the, a part of an uh, ICC profile. And that's configured by some settings thing. Sometimes uh, some other tools are modifying the state and then one process doesn't know about the other process modifying something. It's, it's not ideal. And Right, like th this is an example of how, how it looks unknown, but other uh, systems are not that different in that regard. So basically what we want to change here is, is, is that we're going full Wayland. We, we want to get rid of, like we want to be able for you, you to port all your applications to Wayland and have at least all the features that you had in X11. But ideally, that's where we want to go. We want to make it so that clients do not have to care about color management and still look OK. <laughs> the, the, the big problem that we kind of want to solve is that nowadays, OK, so, so basically the compositor, which currently is dumb because X11 just puts on, on the screen whatever the application tells it to, it, it, it has become smarter. And it has to do color management if if we want to drive displays that are more modern. And we want to have a single source of truth, basically, um, about what the, the colors on the display are. Uh, and that should come from Wayland and not from maybe an X11 atom, maybe from ColorD or whatever, but one source of truth. Uh, some details like. The kernel driver we want we want always to be KMS, and we want to have more control over what actually comes out on the cable, and we want to be, to be able to predict exactly what kind of values we're sending to a to a screen, so that we can know what kind of colorimetry will be displayed, and and that involves not just changes in the compositor, but also in the drivers underneath it and how we are handling this whole um, this, this whole driver thing. Um, because currently it ex exposes properties that are not exactly useful to us. And in general, we want to be able to control the display. It, it has a bunch of prop settings that I talked about that we should be able to control and we have to control to be sure that it does what we expect it to do. So ideally, we're getting rid of a lot of things. Like uh, we have basically Wayland clients. We have uh, maybe a, a a thing to configure the 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 um, the compositor, and that com the configuration can be a bunch of things like uh, a, 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 an an ICC profile can be a specified white point. Um, it can be maybe night light as a configuration, but all of that will go into compositor and there's no weird multiple components like trying to figure out who's right and fighting with each other. And then on the lower levels, we want everything to be 
Tumblr came as, and we want to have control over the display, basically, the, what I said here. And obviously, we want all the clients to be Wayland clients. And they can still, they should still be able to use whatever they're using right now, which means either an ICC profile based uh, color management system or an open. Uh, open color IO one or whatever else they're having right now. The important the important part is that um, the compositor in the middle is understanding what's going on and can do the right thing. And with the compositor doing the right thing, I basically mean that the compositor has to basically understand what's going on, and that's currently not the case. For example, nowadays we have displays which support much more color than they used to. Uh, you have much bigger color volumes. And if we have a certain image that was made for a specific color volume, it was probably made for something, something like sRGB because that is what we used to do all the time. And if you show that image on a display which supports more, a bigger color volume, you basically get colors that are not accurate. Most of the time, like if the display itself has more color, has a bigger color volume, then you get um, oversaturated image basically. Right, and and you kind of have to assume that everything is sRGB. That's like the assumption that everyone does because that's that has been true for a long time that everything is approximately sRGB, but it. Nowadays, it's getting more and more unlikely that this is what the display actually supports, and we are getting in a territory where this is not an assumption that you can make anymore. So what we want to have is basically that uh, clients themselves convey the information about the colors that they produce on a surface, so the, uh, on their window, basically, to the compositor. and then the compositor understands it and makes sure that they're being corrected for the display they're shown on. And this can mean that we have, for example, sRGB content from somewhere on a surface and then next to it, like some HDR video playing, and that's all done on the sRGB display, then it means that the HDR video must be like uh, compressed down and color uh, and tone map down so that it will dis display correctly on an sRGB screen. And you can at the same time have like an HDR monitor next to it. And there we would have to do the exact opposite and like make sure that the sRGB content gets shown correctly on the HDR monitor. And, and this kind of problem with Windows being on like two, uh, two, two outputs at the same time is basically the reason why we can, as much as we try to, at the end of the day, you cannot prepare a surface that will, a window basically that will work for multiple <laughs> outputs. So you have to decide what you, uh, you just have to decide for one color space and then the compositor does the best that it can do to uh, make sure it looks correct on both, both outputs. So yeah, like I said, we, the, the, the solution to this is basically that the clients provide information about what they're doing. Um, and for every client that doesn't know how to provide the content, which is currently all of them, we just have to assume that we are dealing with sRGB content. And the, the nice part about this, however, is that if, you, if, a, if a Windows this color is described completely and it matches whatever the colors are on the on a the, the color properties are on a display then we that compositor can basically skip doing any work this is one of the design goals that we had that uh, we want to make it possible for the client to directly target whatever the display supports and then the compositor can get out of the way and doesn't have to touch it but still if if the client cannot do that then the compositor jumps in and does the correct thing. Like that, that's, that is what we want to change here, basically. Right, so we have all of this, 
uh, yeah, right. So the mismatch between everything is basically um, what we have to compensate for, and that, um, and and the color properties that we care about are basically like the the, the gamut, the tone, so the, the the dynamic range in the image, and something like the reference white, and um, this pass through mode is what we want to achieve most of the time. So I'm not sure how many of you are using uh, Wayland already or not, but I, I basically I think everyone here knows what Wayland is. We are we are getting rid of X11. That will happen. Um, we have like some fallback in the sense of X Wayland and. It will be around for a time, but XValent isn't a perfect backwards compatibility solution. Uh, there's things you can do on on proper X11 that you cannot do in XValent anymore, and therefore we have to kind of find solutions like proper solutions in Wayland. And X11 as a as a protocol can do a lot of things, but the critical thing for us when it comes to color management is uh, explaining the 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 content of the of the windows in terms of the color properties to the compositor is not one of the things that you can do there so to really support anything that isn't an srgb display and target some hdr display for example there's no way around uh, going to wayland here because no one is going to add support for that x11 so at one point or the other, if you want HDR support in your apps, it seems like we have to move over to Wayland. So I, I'm I'm gonna go over like some basics of like how Wayland works here. Uh, this is mostly interesting for developers, I guess. Um, but yeah, let's let's try to do this. Um, Wayland is a is a protocol, which means there are two processes involved and. Like one process talks with the other one, and we we have in Wayland we have objects and there are requests and <coughs> events. That's like a request is something the client sends to the compositor, and event is the other direction around. Um, and we have interfaces on those those objects implement interfaces, and they have yeah they the signature of them describes what they support. Um, for example, if you look at the very basic uh, uh, interface, the WL surface, we, we define the stuff in, in XML, but essentially we have the interface and then inside there is a, it's a request. So that's something that the client sends to the, um, to the server. And it says, for example, here, the damage one, we can say, okay, we will damage a region of a window. So you, Give it an arguments of the x y position, a width and the height, and that's it. And at the other hand, whenever the the user moves uh, the window around and it enters another output, the the compositor will send an event to the client, and it will say, "Hey, you just entered this specific output." So that's essentially how all the boiling protocols work. And if if you ever want to see what's going on behind the scenes uh, when you run a Wayland application, you can just uh, say Wayland debug equals one on the uh, as an environment variable, and then you will see a bunch of debug outputs. So a sequence of basically requests and events. In this case, uh, the client gets the the event enter on a specific output, and then uh, sets a cursor surface. Um, yeah, the, the valent pointer, and then it sets a cursor, cursor surface on the pointer, attaches a buffer to a surface, sets a specific scale on the surface, sets damage, and then commits the buffer, which is basically saying to the uh, uh, compositor that this the state for the uh, current frame is done. So now to the like interesting part for all the color stuff. We have like three different objects that are interesting here. This one is the surface again, which represents like 
Windows and what, whatever else surfaces in the compositor. And we have like th three different protocols nowadays that I use basically. Um, this Linux Steam ABA of color res representation and color management, those latter two are the ones that I'm currently working on and uh, what we really need to get this whole system done. Yeah, so the, the surface represents whatever, uh, any kind of visual thing in the compositor. And mostly they are for top levels, but also for cursors and other things. And the buffer is the thing that contains basically pixel values. Um, right, and, and you can create those p uh, buffers from different factories. And one of those factories is Linux Dim A buff, which is like the modern thing to shovel around pixel data. Um, and yes, so, so you can use the DMA buff protocol to, uh, basically create a buffer, then attach it to a surface. And then in the end, uh, you have a, a, a window with the, with the specific pixels in it. So this, this one. Uh, it's again just a Voiland protocol thing, but essentially what the the DMA buff protocol gives us is like a way to define a few things that are interesting because it, it's a buffer, which means it contains pixel data. So um, let's see, can I? Use... So the mo most important thing here is the format uh, somewhere at the bottom, and that's something the client defines to say how the pixels are laid out in memory. There's also modifiers which kind of change the whole issue around where exactly it is in the, how exactly it's laid out in memory. But uh, the most important thing is the format. Otherwise you have like the, the buffer is a width and a height and it can be multiplanar for YCBCR stuff, but none of that really matters because in the end, the, the format code that you define here is a DRM format code, and you can get some rather interesting and also sometimes really boring ones. So for example, the typical one is um, RGB888 or RGB888. So this defines basically what a pixel looks like. So you get the channels RGB and B, and they're all eight bits wide. Uh, there are also like the 10 bit formats down there, like the RGBX 10, 10, 10, 2. Uh, so there's already like a lot that there's a lot of data in there that is, is required to basically figure out where the color channels are coming from. Uh, and in the case that it's not an RGB value, like I don't know how many of you know about YCBCR, but it's pretty popular for for uh, video formats where you are instead of having RG and B channels, so red, green, and blue, you have a Luma channel and then two Chroma channels, and kind of what we we need here is to convert this YCBCR stuff to RGB, and for that currently all the compositors are doing whatever. Like there's no clear rule about how to do that. And that's what the color representation protocol is supposed to change. And we want to define exactly which matrix has to be used to go from RGB to YCBCR. Uh, there's also subsampling involved, like you, and when subsampling is involved, you have to figure out basically where the, where you want to sample from because it's not clear anymore. So there's quite a few properties about uh, pixels that we have to define that are currently undefined. There's also the alpha mode one, which is uh, quite interesting because currently um, it the, basically it's about the trans transparently or coverage handling. So if you send uh, transparent pixels, for example, to the compositor, it's not clear what exactly they mean. Uh, they can be influenced by transfer characteristics, which means they, uh, depending on if they were pre-multiplied before or after the transfer characteristics, they behave differently. Sometimes 
they are not pre-multiplied at all. Like there are basically three different modes things can be in, but none of that is defined currently. Um, we, we kind of try to define it now in the core Wayland protocol, but uh, the other two options are still very popular and they also make a lot of sense. So in this protocol, we basically want to nail down what exactly, uh, how, how exactly to arrive at some RGB color values. So basically when we have a buffer and then we use the color representation protocol in the end, we get our RGB tuples, uh, triples or whatever, um, which is already quite good because I mean, most of us know exactly what RGB uh, triples are, but um, the problem here really is that in the end, uh, an RGB triple doesn't say a lot. It's just three numbers, but uh, it, it completely depends on the context what those numbers are basically. And then we have our, uh, the next protocol, the color management protocol, which is trying to describe the color of the channels basically. And that's what we have the image description for. So those image descriptions can also be created like in two different ways. So one of them is ICC profiles. You basically hand a compositor an ICC profile and say, this profile describes the, col uh, the color of the surface. Like those, those three numbers have to be interpreted in the context of this ICC profile. Mm -hmm. And then we have a parametric creator, which is basically one that is used in cases where you have like video files. Video files, for example, they don't have IC profiles. They say th they have different specifications and they define exactly the parameters, uh, like the, the, uh, the, all the primaries, the transfer characteristics, uh, all the things you have to care about. So in the end, when you can create uh, different uh, what are they called? Image descriptions from those interfaces, and they are enough to completely describe the color. Right, and and, and so basically, what's important in in the parametric image description are the transfer characteristics, the color primaries. Um, something that is new with HDR are the, like the mastering display characteristics, and also the luminance uh, range, and also the reference here. Uh, I, I want my, maybe I'll try to explain them more later on. But the, the point here is you want to create those image descriptions and then um, set them on, on a surface. And if, if you hand this over to the, uh, to the compositor, it completely understands the color. It has a complete picture of what those color channels mean and can actually do something with them. There's different ways you can like basically handle all of this. Uh, like as a client, you can attach whatever image description you want to your uh, surface as long as it matches the content. And there are a few ways this can be used to be more or less efficient and uh, choose like for every client, there's a way to deal with it. Like if, if a client is a video player, you might want to just set whatever the video is providing you. Whereas if you're an interactive application, you might want to and target the specific output. But that's all decisions the client can do. So with all this stuff, we can completely define the color and the compositor has an understanding of what's going on. But we kind of want HDR, like this is, this is the goal here. So um, to understand really what we need to do to support HDR, we kind of also have to talk about what HDR is. And a lot of people are not completely aware of what it is, but in the end, what it means is that we have more dynamic range on our monitors. Like this is this is the thing that is, is becoming different. We have either um, a brighter white or a darker black. There are also like a, a lot of marketing mater material unfortunately confuses with white color gamut, but yeah. 
it's not the same. There's white color gamut and HDR are not the same. And essentially, HDR is completely different problem from white color gamut. And the problem is like when you turn into an HDR mode, that the color, the complete picture looks completely different. Um, if you pro provide an SDR picture to HDR, then it looks completely dull, uh, completely oversaturated. This way around, uh, it doesn't make any sense. Like, what you really have to do is is to adjust the imagery output via tone mapping, and I think it's also not a new concept. But for compositors, this is something completely new that we have to do. The other uh, new thing here is that we we lost our frame of reference. Like so far, we only had to deal with with SDR pictures, and they are basically all the same in the sense of like we assume they all have the same dynamic range. But if you now have completely different dy dynamic ranges, you also have to question like where is white like a normal a normal white, not just because when you can go much brighter, then everything over it is still white but like what rep represents like a normal a normal white in a scene like this is this, this diffuse white if, if you have like a normal white paper in your hand and uh, that is still white but if there's like the sun in the background then it's much more bright but that's not what we want to consider as like the reference point basically and so we have to for HDR, we have to find this reference again. So what we want to do here is basically, again, the same same deal here with with HDR. We want again the 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 window to describe what it has. Like in this case, we are going from from not just the the um, the primaries and the transfer characteristics to also provide information about the dynamic range it has. So in this in the case, like the, the absolute luminance values, like the minimum it can do, the maximum it can do, and whatever luminance level is the reference white in the image. So the normal white paper, for example. And then the compositor does exactly what it do, does with all the other color characteristics and uh, it adjusts everything for the monitor at hand, which also has like those characteristics. And, and most of the things we are dealing with when it comes to HDR is that we have um, like the PQ encoding. And it's a bit weird because uh, it defines basically a, a specific code points or a specific value means a specific brightness. So you can go from point zero one nits to whatever, I think 10,000 nits or something like that. So Whenever you send values in a PQ encoding, we understand what it means. And at the same time, sRGB is another weird encoding where we have floating point numbers. It's basically <coughs> the sRGB in floating point, where we again have like um, the 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 white is at one one one, but then you can just go uh, and have higher values. So that automatically gives us the reference white, which is at one one one. But there's an unbounded, like a dynamic range with the floating points. Right. So, so basically, we, the, there's a weird thing with uh, HDR that has also made it into like monitors, which is called the HDR metadata. Uh, it's n it's not that we that monitor just can do brighter or darker. It's that the monitor itself accepts a signal that it doesn't actually manage to represent. Like it, they all support PQ, which means this value from 0 0.01 nits to 10,000 nits. But the actual monitors are still not even remotely close to that. So you can may maybe go up to like, if it's a really good one to like a few thousand nits, but not to 10,000. And most normal ones are like in the range of a few hundred nits. So 
they, they accept the signal where you say this content contains something that is 10,000 nits bright, but it actually is not able to display those 10,000 nits. So it internally then tries to map it down as well. And this HDR metadata is kind of trying to, on the one hand, communicate to the sync. So in our case, the compositor, like the range of the format that it actually supports. And on the other hand, there's the metadata in video files, for example, or in sometimes all in images nowadays as well, like PNG got support for this, where it says like, I'm encoded in PQ and I can like, you can encode values from the entire range up to 10,000, but I'm actually just using uh, the format to encode values up to like, let's say 300 nits. So that's something that has also been new in with HDR. And, and, and we support this at the, the protocol level so that we can basically support HDR content mm -hmm. and sRGB. Um, right, so for example, I, I think most of you are familiar with, maybe not, but, but this is how like uh, a color space is represented in 2D. It's like, a, and the point I want to make here is that for f with sRGB, for example, or BT709 is what it's called, you can have like, a sp you can reach a specific part of the colors that exist. And if you use an integer format, then you literally can only represent whatever is inside this gamut, like that's what it's called. And if you then say, okay, let's use a floating point for that. So if you still use the same primaries and use a floating point format for it, you suddenly reach all the colors, like because it's unbounded basically by the floating point format and you can reach all the colors you want. Uh, that's represented by the blue. But if you then have, for example, the BT20, um, 2020 prim primaries for HDR, you can reach a much bigger um, um, color gamut than what you can do with the old BT709. But you can also, again, use like a uh, floating point for it and reach whatever you want. Like this is in principle, you can use floating point and get wherever you want. But what's usually done is that people use like some bounded things, also some integers, like 10 bit integers for BT2020. And then they use the HDR metadata to uh, select like only a part of what they can do. And that is where the actual content is. So in the upper left, you can see the the H basically the 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 color gamut of HDR content, and um, then inside of that is this target color volume. I, I'm not sure how visible that is, but it's smaller than whatever is repre like representable by the encoding itself. And that's the usual thing we get. On the right side is the other way to do HDR with sCRGB. Like we still use the old, like the SDR, the sRGB primaries, but use floating point and then use the same metadata to basically say, um, we only use this part of the, of what we could use. So in both cases, we get this bounded, um, bounded color volume and that's what we need. So essentially with those uh, image descriptions that you can create in Wayland, we can now completely describe everything, even all the HDR bits that are necessary. And that allows us to handle everything in the compositor that needs to be handled. I think I will skip all of this. Um, but if you're interested, like this is how you would basically use everything, uh, how you would create a specific image description for HDR, for PQ in this example, and also for sRGB. <coughs> right, so probably more interesting for all of you when you look at new displays and want to decide what you want to get is um, that you get some, when a display says something like it supports HDR, uh, then you will see something like PQ maybe. <coughs> mm. 
and and what what it technically means uh, when a display says it, it supports HDR is that it accepts specific signals. Uh, in this case, it, it announces basically to the compositor over like the EDID and display ID uh, uh, features that it supports <laughs> HDR signaling. In this case, we have to send some some data to the uh, to the display itself to enable this mode. Like if you get an HDR display, it is not in HDR by default. This is like a conscious design decision they made because if if you go into HDR mode by default, then everything looks just wrong. So um, we have to explicitly turn the monitor into this HDR mode. Yeah, especially on on Intel hardware, on on Intel uh, laptops. Uh, which support HDR, we had uh, some problems getting that working, but I think that's figured out by now. Uh, patches in the kernel should land soon, so that's good. But what's also kind of ugly is that um, if you set a display into HDR mode, what, what often happens is that you, you lose control over uh, your brightness adjustment. Like Most of you know that you have to adjust your screen to whatever environment you're working in. But this this kind of thing just goes away on a lot of uh, monitors for some reason. And it's it's a limitation that we kind of have to work with if we want to support HDR. And we have to basically implement our own uh, um, um, brightness. Uh, we have to implement basically brightness control by, by controlling uh, the, the the values we send to the display, like we just have to send darker values to the to the display to um, lower the overall brightness. Yeah. So, so what often happens when people turn on HDR mode is that like the display it it just displays literally like the values that. The, the the PQ encoding suggests and is often like wrong because they're they're made for for a specific viewing environment that most users are not in. Like it's basically a very dark room, so none of that makes a lot of sense. And we have to act like adjust everything there. So uh, with Like the adjusting here that we have to do, um, it's it's basically replacing whatever brightness control you might have on a laptop or whatever. Um, but ideally, this should still be done in the display. And to some degree, this, for example, the laptop still still support this HDR mode, but you can then also control the brightness. Mm -hmm. So it. it, it HDR monitors are in this weird state where it's not entirely clear what they're supposed to do. Like on, on the laptop, everything, it, usually you can control the brightness because apparently it's more important to do it there. And they actually thought about it. But on uh, on external displays, like a lot of them lose those controls. So yeah, it, it's, it's not a good situation. Right, so now coming back more to the user side, um, what what we want to change basically is that um, so those displays support those different like processing modes. The the the, the default mode is usually what people go with, but uh, HDR is one of the others. But in theory, those those displays also support um, other color spaces uh, like sRGB, like. Usually people set them on their OSD, like on their display itself. But nowadays, it's actually possible that the compositor itself uh, tells the display what it's supposed to expect. So we want to be able to expose this somehow. Like uh, you should go into the settings and you should be able to say, okay, I want, I want to be in the HDR mode or, or in sRGB mode or in the default mode, which could be anywhere in between or whatever. And essentially, this changes the whole like response of, of the monitor. And then 
what, what we want to do again is like we in, in GNOME, for example, we, you can set an ICC profile on, on a display. And it doesn't do much right now because it only applies the VCGT tag, which is like a part of the configuration of the display, but it doesn't actually do any color management, even if you set the profile on the, IC, uh, on the, on the output. So what we want to do is basically you set the mode you want, let's say um, sRGB, and then you can still like provide an ICC profile that uh, completely characterizes the display. You, you might also set like an HDR mode, in which case ICC doesn't make any sense anymore. Like ICC profiles, unfortunately, uh, do not support HDR right now. Uh, another thing that like might come in really handy for a lot of you is that when you have multiple monitors, a lot of the time, like the, the white point is different. Like you, you might like drag one window from one monitor to the other one, and it looks completely different. And it's not even like with color management, this doesn't go away. Like if the white point of two different displays is different, then the result looks just different because the white point is different. Like, so what we want is also that you can easily change the white point of a display. So that like all of your, like if you have two displays next to each other, that you can say, okay, they both use the same white point. So you track one, uh, like one window from one monitor to the other one, and you still get the, like you get the same colors, like the same colorimetry actually on the screen. And again, like we have to, like for HDR, uh, introduce new concepts about, um, about brightness control because the display somehow uh, rob us of their own control there. And with HDR, it also like becomes necessary to, like maybe it becomes necessary to figure out the black level. That's something that currently isn't um, looked at at all, but like when you move around with a display, and for example, we are in like a rather dark room right now, so there's more dynamic range than when you go outside because then suddenly your display, display reflects a lot of light. And this light means that the entire black level is shifted up and you you don't see the details in the black anymore. And that's not something that usually is like, it's not something any app is accounting for. Like they still assume that you have all the dynamic range in the blacks and try to show you something there and then you're not able to see it. And, and then the last one, which is probably really important for a lot of people here, is that we also want to make sure that um, calibration and profiling works again. Like this is something that currently does not work. So uh, if you have a display and you have a device for calibration and profiling, then you're probably using X11 right now because that's the only place where the tools that exist actually work. Um, and when we are starting to do color management, we are we are adjusting the colors on the fly in the compositor. And and one of the benefits of the X11 model where you where the compositor doesn't understand the colors and just puts them on the screen is that you can easily profile things like. You, you, you create a window, you set a specific color, for example, red, like completely red, and then it goes through X11 onto the cable and on the cable, it still says completely red. And then you, it goes to the display and then on the display, you can measure what does red mean. Like nothing in between really changes what's going on, except for like the one VCGD thing in the middle, but that's an implementation detail, I guess. So X11 makes it easy to actually measure things. So all the measuring tools, they work on X11. But if we start to like uh, in the compositor change the colors, there's no guarantee that what, whatever you're trying to measure is the thing that you actually measure because you might have screwed up your colors. So we kind of need to figure out how to get a mode where you can actually measure the display so that you all, all of you can still use your displays and profile and calibrate them to however you want and create your profiles so that you can still keep working. Uh, this is currently the part that is like not not so far along because we're trying to get like the model right and implement it in compositors right now. 
So not a lot of thought has been put into this, but we know that we have to do it and it will come hopefully at some point. Um, yeah. And I think with all of that, we, we should be in a good, pretty good place. And I guess that's everything I had. Thank you.